Section 18 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 14, Natural History, Part 3, The Insect World. Insects Almost Ubiquitous The immense and varied group of insects constitutes by far the largest class in the animal kingdom. It numbers as many as 200,000 named species, the majority of which are predominantly active types. Such a wealth of forms, the species in a single family of insects may outnumber the stars one can count on a clear night, shows that as a class insects are extraordinarily successful. Many reasons are given for this dominance, all pointing to the striking fact that insects, by means of manifold adaptations, are able to fill many niches and so attain a wide distribution. Few haunts are destitute of insect life. Butterflies and mosquitoes are known to penetrate to extreme arctic regions. A small kind of butterfly is found in Ecuador at an elevation of 16,500 feet. Insects inhabit desert tracts far out of reach of water, and limestone caverns have their cave dwellers, often pale and blind unless their descent to this unusual haunt has been comparatively recent. Many forms live in fresh water, even hot springs have their insects, and some beetles, for instance, are found on the tidal zone of the seashore. The actual sea seems very unsuitable for insect life, and yet there is a family of skimmers, Halobatidae, which run about on the surface of the open ocean and even dive when it is stormy. The success of insects. Insects are typically winged creatures, and their power of flight extends their range. Given the opportunity to colonize new areas and to migrate to fresh localities in times of stress, their bodies are extremely well adapted from the mechanical point of view. Their sense organs are highly developed, sensitive feelers, compound eyes, and so on and their mouth parts are remarkably adapted to suit different modes of feeding. Probably much of their success in the struggle for existence is due to the adaptations of their circulatory and respiratory systems, which enable the nutrition of the organs of the body to go on with great rapidity. The tissues are continually bathed in nutritive fluid, while every part of the body is kept aerated by the extensive system of air tubes. These facts account for the abundant energy and consequent activity which is so characteristic of the class. It may be doubted if the insect's blood ever becomes impure. Another factor tending towards the success is the change of habit due to the change of form which occurs during the course of many life histories. This implies changes in diet and therefore a lessening of the drain on a particular foodstuff. In other ways also the changes of form and habit may lead to survival in the struggle for life. There is frequently a tiding over of difficult times. For instance, quiescence during periods when conditions of temperature and food are unfavorable. Many insects pass the winter in a lethargic state inside well-protected cocoons. Protective Adaptations Another factor which helps to give success to insects in maintaining their hold in various habitats is the way in which general form and color are adapted to the environment. Protective coloring in animals has formed the subject of a special article, but it may be noted that there are no clearer instances of protective resemblance than among insects. Not only do they very often closely resemble the general color of their natural surroundings, but form, as well as color, may add still more to the similarity, which gives security to the insect by concealing it effectively from its enemies. We can thoroughly understand the wonder of this protective resemblance only when we study it under natural conditions. Many very gaudy butterflies can hardly be distinguished from flowers when they alight on plants. Many moths in their resting position hide the bright colors of the hind pair of wings with the duller forewings, which may nearly resemble lichen or the bark of trees. The coloration may afford an effective protection in other ways, by warning and by mimicry. Some insects, such as the wasp or the ladybird beetle, positively court attention with their vivid coloring and markings. They are colored not to be hidden but to be seen. Such insects always have some other form of protection, a sting or an unpleasant taste which their enemies come to associate with their striking hues and therefore avoid. 
no doubt conspicuous individuals will be snapped at and killed by birds and other enemies are experimenting but the enemies learn by experience and the species with the warning colors gradually attain a position of security section one pedigree the pedigree of insects is obscure they belong to the large group of joint-legged arthropods which shows numerous affinities with the ringed worms or annelids but also many advances such as the greater development of appendages in peripatus and its allies which are widely distributed over the world worm-like velvet-skinned little creatures shy and nocturnal in habit we find living links between annelids and insects in their excretory tubes muscular arrangement and hollow appendages they strongly suggest the ringed worm type but they combine with these and other annelid features distinct indications of arthropod characters such as the system of breathing tubes and the appendages in the surface of the mouth which reach further development in the class of insects general characters of insects insects peripatus centipedes and millipedes have a common respiratory system consisting of tubular trachea which marks them off from the gill-breathing arthropods crustaceans and sensitive feelers which distinguish them from the spider and scorpion group arachnids in the class of insects the body of the adult state is divided into three main regions one the head two the thorax or forebody three the abdomen or hind body the outer covering of most insects is hard and firm composed of non-living cuticle made of chitin a somewhat horn-like substance secreted by the underlying living skin the chitinous plates which make protective armor are firmly fused in the head region but in the thorax and in the abdominal part the different rings are joined by flexible areas permitting more freedom of movement thus the segmented architecture of the body is more clearly seen in the thorax and abdomen than in the head region where fusion has obliterated the boundaries of successive segments of the body in rapidly flying insects there is often a fusion of thorax rings to form a firm basis for the action of the wings it must be clearly understood that in the insect's body the muscles are inside the skeleton whereas in ourselves the skeleton is covered by the muscles the two plans of architecture are utterly different the insect's head the insect's head which bears one pair of feelers or antenna and usually three pairs of jaws is relatively small firm and compact separated from the thorax by a narrow membrous neck allowing freedom of movement one sees this very well on the common house fly all adult insects except some primitive and some degenerate species have a pair of compound eyes those simple eyes may be present also the compound eyes project on each side of the head as convex immovable structures there is only one pair though each eye may be partially divided as in some of the aquatic whirligig beetles in which half of the eye is directed up to keep a lookout for danger from above while the other half is scanning the water below in search of prey the compound eye consists of a great many similar parts each a complete organ of vision but requiring the surrounding elements to form the whole image each of the many elements of the eye makes a small image so that the whole image is a mosaic of separate contributions which combine in a unified visual impression conveyed to the brain for the amorous insect does not see one thousand desired mates one through each of its eye elements the question is not an easy one but it should be noticed that in some cases example fireflies the eye elements no longer act separately but a single combined image is thrown on the back of the eye the antennae are appendages set in sockets on the crown of the head and consist of a series of joints varying from one or two to a large number and of many different shapes they are of the greatest importance to the insect as organs of touch by means of sensory bristles connected with underlying nerve fibers and also in connection with the sense of smell of hearing in insects very little is securely known further the head carries three pairs of mouth appendages homologous with legs which are variously transformed for different modes of feeding biting or sucking it is very interesting to find the same three parts are changed in scores of different ways insect legs the legs which are borne on the three rings or segments of the thorax region show many different peculiarities to suit different habits the front pair is considerably lengthened in certain beetles that climb about on the bark of trees in the mole cricket they are converted into burrowing implements the terminal joints being arranged as shears for cutting through plant roots the praying mantis and the water scorpion both show the forelegs modified into pincher-like traps for seizing prey usually the middle pair is not greatly modified but in some water bugs like the water boatmen 
the middle legs are the longest and have become effective oars for rowing on the surface of the water the hind pair of legs of many insects is elongated for jumping as in grasshoppers and locusts and some beetles certain beetles and bees and wasps have a comb or bristle-lined cavity on the leg by means of which they clean their feelers while some butterflies use their feeble front legs to brush off dust from their heads ants are particular about their toilet in the course of the day's work an ant's antenna may become soiled on its first pair of legs it is provided with what we might call brushes and combs as we have described and the ant may be seen to draw its besmeared antenna through this brush and comb arrangement on the forelegs one of the legs will be passed over the head and body its other legs sweeping off every particle of dirt no cat is more fastidious over its toilet ants will even wash and brush each other just as they will exchange greetings as they meet by movements of their antenna the hind legs of bees shows a modification for pollen gathering a broadening of the shin to make a basket into which the pollen is swept by special bristles insects breathing breathing takes place by means of a system of air tubes or trachea which penetrate to every hole and corner of the body trachea arise as inpushings of the skin and the layer of the chitin which lines them is continuous with that which covers the whole body in the larger air tubes this chitin is thickened spirally in threads and this keeps the tubes from collapsing air enters the body by openings spiracles or stigmata occurring on most of the body rings through these spiracles the air is driven out by movements of contraction fresh air passes in passively as the body expands as in birds so in insects expiration is the active part of the breathing process the air tubes fork and refork sending side branches to every corner of the body even to the tips of the feelers so that the whole body is thoroughly aerated the extensiveness of the air tube system compensates for the relatively poor blood system in aquatic forms various devices are adopted to secure a supply of oxygen some water insects come to the surface to breathe others like young mayflies have special structures tracheal gills of different types the water beetle dytiscus has its spiracles on its back and when it dives under the water it carries with it in an airtight compartment between its back and its hard wing covers enough air to last for several minutes the bubble of air method is another plan adopted by the whirligig beetles and some water bugs whose covering of fine hairs entraps bubbles of air ensuring a sufficient supply of air about the body for a short time under water in addition to the respiratory system there are inside the body of an insect all the usual organs food canal and associated parts a heart excretory organs reproductive organs and so on some insects are so small that they can creep through the eye of a needle and it is difficult to believe that in such minute dimensions all the ordinary organs are packed away locomotion insects are essentially active and they exhibit various kinds of locomotion many grubs and maggots are quite passive but even limbless larvae though naturally not so active as the leg types have their ways of getting about they may jerk themselves along with the aid of bristles or jaws they may make relatively enormous leaps into the air by taking their tails in their mouths and suddenly letting go or they may swing themselves from place to place by paying out silken lines from their mouths young dragonflies propel themselves through the water by means of the forcible expulsion of water from the end of the food canal insects walk run and jump with the quadrupeds fly with the birds glide with the serpents and swim with the fishes it is often asked how a fly contrives to walk upon smooth perpendicular surfaces and one answer is that a vacuum is made below a little soft pad which is present on the foot another explanation is that there seems to be a slight exudation of a haze of moisture from the foot beetles which have relatively strong legs very different from the weak legs of a butterfly can run with considerable speed while many insects one has only to think of a flea or a grasshopper are pre-eminently leapers the most primitive insects the springtails and bristletails are entirely wingless but a springtail is an expert jumper it has at the end of the body an effective leaping apparatus consisting of two elongated prongs which are bent under the abdomen and pressed down affording such a leverage when the retaining catch is released that the insect springs forward a relatively long distance compared with the size of its body from great leaps to the beginnings of flight is an understandable step in progress and most insects are flyers there are many patterns of wing but essentially they are lightly built mere flattened sacks of skin often transparent and fragile but beating the air with an extraordinarily rapid motion it has been calculated that a fly makes three hundred thirty wing strokes in a second a humble bee two forty a wasp one ten a dragonfly twenty eight and a butterfly nine the rapidity of the movement produces a hum or buzz 
Bees and wasps have two pairs of membrous wings, but the fore wing and the hind wing on each side act as a single organ, for the hind wing has a row of minute hooklets, which fit into the curled over posterior edge of the fore wing and lock the two wings together. In dragonflies, the two wings are not attached, but the two pairs are coordinated by the action of very strong muscles, and the larger dragonflies are excellent flyers. They are probably helped in steering by the weight of their bodies, the lightness of most insects being against good steering, as they are liable to be blown about by the wind. Whatever the pattern of wing or the speed of the wing beats, the total distance insects can fly is not great. They seldom wander far afield. Some insects literally fly but once. A mayfly may rise at noon from the water that cradled it, and by sundown its aerial dance of love may be over and its lifeless body be floating on the surface of the pool. Section 2. Instincts and Intelligence Insects are largely creatures of instinct, with inborn capacities for doing apparently clever things, but yet with some degree of intelligence. In an animal's behavior there is often, no doubt, a mingling of different kinds of activities unified in a way that baffles analysis. In many cases, their behavior under new conditions, their powers of effectively meeting new ends, go beyond mere instinct. What are we to say of the following? The tailor ants, common in warm countries, make a shelter by drawing leaves together, and their cooperative hauling is admirable. Their mandibles are their needles, if you like, but they have nothing to fix the leaves with. What does each do but take a larva in its mouth so that the silk secreted from the offspring serves as an adhesive gum? The tailor ants nest in trees, and they sometimes find it difficult to bring two rather distant leaves close enough together to be sewn. Then, as Bunyan relates, they have a course to a perfectly extraordinary cooperation. Five or six will form a living chain to bridge the gap. The waist of A is gripped in the mandibles of B, who in turn is gripped by C, and so on, a notable gymnastic feat. Time does not appear to be of much account, but they work definitely towards a result and many chains work together for hours on end, trying to draw two leaves close to one another. We could not have a better instance of social cooperation. An eyewitness, Mr. L. G. Gilpin Brown, writes from Ceylon, Sometimes one will see an ant with a larva on its mandible stalking aimlessly about on the outside of the nest. It stumbles on a small hole. It proceeds to study that hole, walks all round it, walks over it, and eventually decides that it really is a hole, whereupon it proceeds to business. Feeling around the edge with its antenna, it dumps the head of the larva on one side so as to fasten the thread of silk there, moves over and fastens it down on the other side, comes back again, and so on, each trip leaving a thread of silk behind until the hole is completely sealed up. A common harvesting ant of South Europe collects seeds of clover-like plants, lets them begin to sprout so that the tough envelopes are burst, exposes them to the sun so that the germination does not go too far, takes them back underground and chews them into dough, and finally makes this into little biscuits which are dried in the sun and stored for winter use. What a brilliant idea! And yet it cannot be that. It's suggested by the semi-domestication of green flies by a certain species of ants. And what should we say of the slaves which others bluff into service? Many white ants or termites grow highly nutritious molds in extensive, specially constructed beds of chewed wood, and some of the true ants show a similar habit. On the wayside plants in early summer, we see everywhere the frothy masses called cuckoo spit, each made by a larval frog hopper, which whips a little sugary sap, a little ferment, and a little wax into a strange persistent foam, protective against enemies and against the heat of the sun the creature literally saving its life by blowing soap bubbles. Not far off, on a bare, sandy patch, are the deep shafts sunk by the grubs of the beautiful green tiger beetle. The grub, with quaint somersault movements inside the shaft, thrusts the loose earth with great force into the walls and beats them smooth. Eventually it fixes itself near the top of the shaft so that the roof of its head forms a trap-door. When an ant or some other small insect settles down on this living lid, the grub suddenly explodes like a jack-in-the-box, hurling its victim violently against the hard upper edge of the shaft wall. The sucked body is afterwards jerked out. The world is full of these inventions. How are we to understand the behavior of one of the digger wasps, which lays its eggs in a sunk shaft and provisions this with paralyzed caterpillars? While the hunting and storing are in progress, the wasp shuts the mouth of the shaft after each visit, but it does so in a rough and ready fashion, 
When the larder is full, however, it seals the entrance with earth and makes a neat job of it. Nay, it takes a minute pebble in its jaws and beats the earth smooth. Who said animals could not use tools? It seems that using the pebble is not part of the instinctive routine, but is an individual touch, probably with more vivid awareness than is associated with the rest of the agency. But the difficulty is to think of the origin of either the routine or the finishing touch without postulating intelligence, or at least some appreciation of significance. Homing it is well known that ants and bees can find their way home from a distance. Ants evidently take impressions by touch, sight, or sense of smell of certain signposts. There may even be a muscular memory of the movements affected and of the amount of work done. Probably ants improve gradually in their wayfinding as they learn to make use of a combination of various hints. An interesting experiment suggested that bees build up a knowledge of the country round about the hive. Professor Jung of Geneva took twenty bees from a hive near the lake and liberated them at a distance of six kilometers in the country. Seventeen returned to the hive, some within an hour. Next day the successful seventeen were taken on a boat to a distance of three kilometers on the lake. When liberated, they flew off in all directions, but apparently they missed the necessary signposts, for none of them found their way home. On the other hand, experiments have given results that indicate that bees have a sense of direction, comparable to that of carrier pigeons. Even bees with their eyes obscured have been known to make a bee line for the hive from considerable distances, but there is no doubt that bees make cautious and systematical trial flights of orientation when a hive is placed in a new position. Intelligent Behavior An outstanding feature of ants is that of instinctive socialization. They do not live unto themselves, but for the general good of the community. They are indefatigable, but whether they toil consciously for the sake of anything, or what we are to read in their capacity for unified action, who shall say? It is difficult to accept the opinion of some naturalists that instinctive behavior is unaccompanied by any awareness of the meaning or feeling of the end. Whenever this difficulty is obvious, it is customary to say that intelligence has, for the time being, taken the reins. In any case, the facts are wonderful enough. It is among the social insects that the most pronounced evidences of intelligence are found. Intelligence is an eminently social faculty, as Kropotkin says. Language, imitation, and accumulated experience are so many elements of growing intelligence of which the unsociable animal is deprived. Therefore we find at the top of each class of animals the ants, the parrots, and the monkeys, all combining the greatest sociability with the highest development of intelligence. The fittest are thus the most sociable animals, and sociability appears as a chief factor of evolution, both directly by securing the well-being of the species while diminishing the waste of energy, and indirectly by favoring the growth of intelligence. Mutual help is practiced extensively among insects of various kinds. The burying beetles, which usually lead a solitary life, call to their aid a number of their fellows when there is a corpse to be buried. Many caterpillars weave a silken web to make a shelter for a whole brood, while the full-grown procession caterpillars march together from their feeding ground on the trees to a soft place on the ground where they can bury themselves and become moths. Locusts display gregarious habits also which are of mutual advantage. For instance, it is a common practice for the wingless young to make a living bridge over a moderately broad stream plunging into the water and grappling for sticks and straws, and scrambling for a breathing space on their comrades' bodies, till the whole swarm passes across the stream. Comparatively few are drowned, as the same individuals are seldom in the water the whole time. Such associations for mutual aid suggest the beginnings of societies, but they are not nearly so highly evolved as those seen among the termites, ants, bees, and wasps, where the social habits extend to the welfare of the young, and cooperation reaches a high level. Kropotkin says, If we knew no other facts from animal life than what we know about the ants and the termites, we already might safely conclude that mutual aid, which leads to mutual confidence, the first condition of courage, and the individual initiative, the first condition for intellectual progress, are two factors infinitely more important than mutual struggle in the evolution of the animal kingdom. The fact is that the struggle for existence, which includes all the answers back that living creatures make to environing difficulties and limitations, sociology pays just as well as intensified competition, or it may be, pays better. End of section 18 
Section 19 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 14, Natural History, Part 3. The Insect World. Section 3. The Story of the Ants. The Marvels of the Ant Hill. Of all insects, ants must be placed on the highest level, for none have better mastered the art of living together in a mutually beneficial manner, and many ant communities show considerable elaboration. Let us, then, take the case of the ants as a particular illustration of the distinctive features of insect societies. Here we have a community of separate individuals with more or less of a corporate life, and with the power of acting as a unity. Many ants live for a number of years, so that one generation may teach another the profitable arts which lead to the success of the community. The welfare of the species is the important matter, and the individual is often sacrificed, as well as specialized, for the common good. There are three types of individuals, winged males, winged females, and wingless workers, or undeveloped females, and the workers may be of different kinds, large and small, or with huge mandibles in the soldier type. We see a division of labor. The busy workers tread the neighborhood of the nest into a pattern of ant roads, by which they come and go on their foraging expeditions. Smell counts for much in wayfinding. Within the nest, the workers have their home duties. They look after the young, feeding them and carrying them from room to room to secure a suitable temperature, and they bite open the cocoons when the perfect insects are ready to emerge. Mutual aid and harmony seem to reign within the community, but there are terrible wars with other species, which are carried out in a well-organized fashion. Ants have the instinct of acting together and seldom make individual attacks, but they never seem to hesitate to sacrifice themselves for the protection of the community. Sometimes these warlike expeditions are initiated with a definite end in view, that of capturing slaves. For instance, the Amazon ants, which have jaws well suited for warfare but inconvenient for the peaceful occupations of life, habitually keep slaves to wait upon them. Professor Wheeler thus describes them. While in the home nest they sit about in stolid idleness or pass the long hours begging the slaves for food, or cleaning themselves and burnishing their ruddy armor. But when outside the nest they display a dazzling courage and capacity for concerted action. Scouts report their discovery of a brown ant colony, and a raid promptly follows, the Amazons returning victorious with a large number of prisoners, which become faithful slaves. Darwin's suggestion of the origin of slave-making was that many ants capture the pupa of other ants for food, that some of the stored pupa might be unthinkingly reared, that if their presence in the community was not resented, but proved useful, the slave-making habit might make ground. Like the termites, the true ants frequently have guests within their homes. Certain little crickets find shelter and abundant food in this hospitable haunt. They beg food from the ants, and usually they shamelessly steal from the newly fed young ants. Beetles, too, with a peculiar fragrance that makes them welcome guests, persuade the ants to share the sweet substances they carry in their crops by stroking them till they deliver up the coveted dainty. One species of ant carries mites about on the body, feeding them and caring for them, but apparently deriving no benefit from them. Evidently, ants are fond of keeping pets. One of the peaceful occupations ants pursue is keeping cattle. Their cows are little aphids or green flies, which they cherish for the sake of the sweet honeydew that exudes from their bodies. Possibly, at first, it was simply a matter of feeding at the same table, when the ants would discover the sugary fluid and get into the way of licking the green flies. The eggs of certain aphids, which are of no direct use to the ants, are brought into the nest and protected carefully from the severities of winter until the warm weather comes. When the young aphids are brought out and put on their food plant, walled in by little cattle pens of earth. By keeping these eggs safe for six months, the ants ensure a supply of the food delicacy during the following summer. A truly remarkable case of prudence. The Wonderful Leaf Cutting Ant In North America there are agricultural ants, which weed a space near the nest and only allow plants with edible seeds to grow there. These seeds they gather in due season and store in the form of little biscuits, which are made from a chewed seed dough dried in the sun. Another industry is a cultivation of fungi for food, another point in which they agree with the termites, and this habit is seen among the leaf-cutting ants. The fungus is grown in the underground nest on a spongy framework of chewed leaves. 
and the ants not only keep undesirable fungi from growing amongst their peculiar delicacy, but they keep their specialty from fructifying, which would spoil it for their purpose. Much has been added to our knowledge of the leaf-cutting ants by Mr. Beebe, who, in his fascinating book, The Edge of the Jungle, 1921, gives us an account of his own observations of a species of atta in British Guiana. He had the good fortune to see at one time a royal procession leaving the nest in preparation for the nuptial flight. The great queen labored painfully up to the tunnel far away from the real entrance to the nest. Behind her came the kings, much smaller than she, but large in comparison with the workers that ran all about them. When the queen reached the surface, she poised herself on the tips of her slender legs and stretched out her great wings, looking like an aeroplane in miniature. Immediately the little workers swarmed over her, inspecting every organ, cleaning her antenna, legs, and gauzy rings. She had endured this for a few minutes, then moved her wings, threw off her load of busy mechanics, slowly rose in the air, followed by the males, and was soon lost to view. But on another occasion the observer was able to follow the story farther, for he saw a queen descend in a long spiral to the ground, rest a few minutes, clean her antenna, and begin to scrape at the sand with her jaws, the foundation of a new colony at which for many days she labors alone. She plants the little fungus pellet she has carried with her from the old nest in a pouch in the lower part of her mouth, and tends it with the utmost solicitude. The care and feeding in her past life have stored within her this substance for vast numbers of eggs. Nine out of ten she lays, she eats to give her strength to go on with her labors. And when the first larva emerge, they too are fed with surplus eggs. There are three castes of workers, large soldiers, ordinary workers, and small workers, or as Mr. Beebe names them, Maxims, Mediums, and Minims. The first brood which hatches out in about six weeks are all minimums and they take charge at once of the fungus, enlarging the nest, attending to the queen and the young, and other domestic occupations, when the larger workers emerge, foraging and leaf-cutting begin. In bands they issue forth and search about until they find one of the ant trails trodden down by millions of their kind before them, and stream along it till instinct impels them to climb a tree, and drives each ant out upon a leaf. Standing firmly on the leaf, he measures its distance by cutting across a segment of a circle with one of his hind feet as center. He does not scissor his way across, but bit by bit sinks the tip of one jaw, hook-like, into the surface and brings the other up to it, slicing through the tissue with surprising ease. Holding his bit of leaf edgewise, he bends his head as far down as possible and secures a strong purchase along the very rim, when as he raises his head the leaf rises with it, suspended high over his back, out of the way. From this the ant gets the popular name of parasol ant. Mr. Beebe, with due precautions against attack by the insects, which are formidable collectively, dug out a large nest. At first only workers came forth, but by and by the large, one-eyed, round-headed soldiers lumbered forth to battle, and attacked his well-greased boots. He tells us that their bulldog-like grip, which is not relaxed with death, is taken advantage of by the Indians, who use them for stitching wounds, applying their jaws to the opposed edges of skin, then snipping off their bodies. As we have mentioned, the leaves the ants bring in are not eaten, but are masticated to a pulp and used as a fertilizer on which to grow the fungus, which is their only food, indoors at least. Three feet down, the great corridors opened out at intervals to the chambers as large as a football, which were filled with the soft whitish mold, which is the raison d'etre of all the ants' labor. In one of these chambers, Mr. Beebe found groups of workers in the act of chewing up the leaf pulp. The Ways of the Army Ants of great interest, too, is Mr. Beebe's account of the habits of the formidable army ants. Discovering a nest of these on the ceiling of an outhouse, the naturalist made for himself an observation post by placing, at the cost of several fiery stings, a chair with its legs in tins of tarry disinfectant. There, within a foot or two of these myriads of terrible jaws, he spent many hours watching the home life of the colony. The whole structure, foundations, walls, and ceilings, was made of living ants. Their legs stretched out to the utmost, their bodies erect, and their weapons always in a position of readiness for battle. The entrance was guarded by a mat of living ants, and near the door the edges thickened and met overhead to form a tunnel through which every returning worker had to pass with her booty. Returning soldiers dropped their load of plunder near the entrance to be dealt with by the workers. They were then immediately surrounded by a group of workers who put them through a very thorough scraping and cleaning, and they not only submitted with good grace, 
but turned over on their backs to facilitate the process spraying with formal disorganized the colony which broke up in long festoons and moved away carrying eggs and larvae next morning it was found that about a third of the ants had remained on the floor in charge of the larvae at the critical stage of passing into pupil stage the workers were very busy gnawing wood to dust and rags to shreds to provide the light covering which seemed necessary before the larvae would begin to spin the following morning the whole horde had disappeared termites or white ants are not related to the true ants but their achievements are equally wonderful they are abundant in many warm countries notably tropical africa they live together in great communities sharing a many-chambered earthen nest the hills or termiteries which they build are often twice a man's height and strong enough to stand upon in south africa telegraph posts have to be made out of iron to resist their jaws there is a striking division of labor as with the black termite so abundant in ceylon when on the march the black termites move in great armies sometimes comprising three hundred thousand individuals it has been computed that there are two hundred soldiers to every one thousand workers the number of soldiers guarding a march varying with the danger the long troop of workers marches between two lines of soldiers their tactics are nothing short of extraordinary there are guides and scouts searching out new lines for foraging very carefully step by step just like cats they slink forward one behind the other and if the foremost detects anything the least suspicious he draws nervously back pulling his brave comrades after him there are soldiers that restore order in the ranks where there is panic the orders seem to be given through the antenna or by a quivering of the whole body professor bouillon tells of a war which lasted for three days the black termites often wage a bitter battle with the well-known tailor ant oikophila when the latter draw near the termites squirt full in their faces drops a secretion of fluid which seems to drive the true ants almost crazy section four the story of bees the beehive in the hive bees apis we have a further illustration of insect communal life whatever the nature of the communal life of bees may be we cannot liken it to that of human society the one is run on predominantly instinctive lines the other is predominantly intellect the element of permanence distinguishes their communities for many workers as well as the queen survive the winter to the industry and food storing habit of the hive bee is probably due their complex social life the storing has enabled the community to survive unfavorable seasons and become permanent when spring reawakens the earth and the willow trees are bedecked with catkins and gorse and violets and primroses sent out a fragrant invitation the bee world resumes its busy life again the workers set to work to spring clean the hive and build new combs of hexagonal cells to accommodate the eggs the queen has again begun to lay some of the workers sally forth to bring fresh stores of pollen and honey while others are nurse workers in charge of the fast-filling nurseries in early summer the hive is a prosperous and busy city inhabited by three distinct types of individuals the head of the community is the queen not by reason of her wits for her daughters far surpass her in brains and activity but because she is the mother bee who alone can increase or restore the population the queen one of the most remarkable facts about hive bees is the apparently psychical dependence of the community on the presence of the queen if she is removed the bad news spreads quickly through the hive and there is a strange disorganization when the beekeeper replaces her the good news soon circulates and there is harmony once again according to some authorities the queen has a peculiar odor which is reassuring to the workers there is no doubt that smell counts for much among bees the queen bee is concerned only with egg laying the life of the hive is sustained by the worker bees which are active intelligent but sterile females with their reproductive systems in a state of arrested development thirdly there is the drone section of the community the males who take no part in the work and forage only for themselves and then not sufficiently to satisfy their greed for honey it has been said that they comport themselves in the hive as did penelope's suitors in the house of ulysses indelicate and wasteful sleek and corpulent fully content with their idle existence as honorary lovers they feast and carouse throng the alleys obstruct the passages and hinder the work but this is not quite accurate drones spend much of their time flying about very energetically in the vicinity of the hive they are on the lookout for an emerging queen and they are usually disappointed the bees diligence the stronger workers have to provide food for the whole colony their diligence is immense they toil from morning to night with ceaseless energy gathering in the precious store of honey and pollen and it is said that in summer time the life of the worker bee is only about two months their brains become hopelessly fatigued in a colony of fifty thousand bees it has been estimated that there are thirty thousand workers and if each makes ten trips a day three hundred thousand flowers would be visited 
about thirty-seven thousand loads of nectar are required for the production of a pound of honey to obtain the nectar the bee protrudes its tongue into the flower tube and sucks up the nectar into its mouth and thence into the honey bag where it changes into honey which is deposited in storing cells for the indoor workers to draw on for themselves and also of course for the nutrition of the larva the golden pollen is kneaded into a small ball and carried back to the hive in the pollen basket a little cavity in the bee's hind leg there is a popular idea that bees fly about from flower to flower in a haphazard way sipping nectar from any blossom that takes their fancy but as a matter of fact and as aristotle noticed many bees keep as a rule to a single species of flower for collecting pollen and nectar this is an advantage to both flower and insect if the bee were to go from one type of flower to a quite different one time would be lost in locating the nectar moreover when the bee is constant for a while to the same kind of flower cups pollination is effected and waste of pollen is prevented the mutual aid which is an undoubted fact in the bee society sometimes takes the form of showing each other valuable sources of nectar the nurseries within the hives the younger workers are busily looking after the nurseries and attending on the queen the newly hatched grubs are fed on a kind of pap regurgitated by their nurses but soon they are ready for a more substantial diet of pollen and honey then the larvae spin cocoons and the workers shut the cells with little caps of porous wax and leave their charges to a thirteen-day pupation after which yet another generation of worker bees bite off the roofs of their cradles and join in the busy life of the hive in larger cells the queen deposits eggs which are not fertilized these develop into drones still later in the season royal cells are constructed in which the queen lays fertilized eggs identical with those laid in the ordinary worker cells but the grubs which hatch out receive a special royal jelly from the mouths of their attendants instead of the usual fare of masticated pollen and the effect of this diet is to make the grubs develop into princesses instead of workers it should be noted that a queen bee receives from a drone in the course of her nuptial flight a store of sperm cells with which she may fertilize the eggs she is laying during the next year or more it depends on the egg-laying movements of the queen whether the laid egg is fertilized or not the swarm then comes a remarkable upheaval of the busy hive the departure of a swarm headed by the queen bee whether swarming is due to the overcrowded state of the hive or to the queen's excitement when her young rivals are stirring in the royal cradles or to a sudden desire on the part of the workers a hearkening back to the time when there were no hives and motherhood was not given only to one among thousands a desire to break out of their prison bounds of order commendable toil chill maidenly propriety who shall say but suddenly the routine of the hive is broken through the work is suspended and many of the workers become restless and excited and gorge themselves with honey till at a given signal the swarm issues from the hive in a tense direct vibrating uninterrupted stream that at once dissolves and melts into space where the myriad transparent furious wings weave a tissue throbbing with sound the mad joyous dance in the sunlight over the swarm returns to the earth and now there is the morrow to consider and a new home has to be built scouts go out and when they have found a suitable site the workers at once begin to fashion a new comb in which the queen lays eggs and so a new city springs up the hexagonal cells of the comb are made of thin plates of pliable wax which comes from little pockets on the bee's abdomen to start the secretion of the wax great heat is needed so the bees gather together in a great pendant mass till a strange sweat white as snow and airier than the down of a wing is beginning to break over the swarm the worker bee removes the wax scales from her body and with a pair of pincers she has at one of her knee joints and then shoes them into soft paste which can be moulded into the delicate fabric of the cells honeycomb the bee's comb is one of the wonders of the world in spite of its extraordinary fragility it is able to suspend a weight thirty times as great as its own a small block of wax attached to the roof of the hive makes the foundation from which the layers of the cells grow downward and sideways leaving a gangway for the streams of bees to pass to and fro the usual shape of the cells is hexagonal individually well suited for the cylindrical body of a grub together ideally constructed to prevent the waste of space but bees adapt themselves to unusual circumstances and build triangular square or other cells in odd corners if the need arises the cells are not quite horizontally placed having a slight upward tilt which prevents the spilling of thin honey extreme delicacy of touch is required in the moulding of the plastic wax for the one to one hundred eighty part of an inch is the thickness of the tissue paper like cell walls the nuptial flight while the new colony is rapidly growing up life continues in the old hive it is in fact about to renew its youth 
one of the princesses is awaking and the remaining workers are watching over her she appears from the shelter of the royal nursery and the workers brush her and clean her and caress her impelled by some strange instinct she immediately seeks the other cradles tears open the cells and relentlessly stings her sisters her possible rivals to death a few days later on a bright and sunny day she leaves the hive for her nuptial flight she soars aloft into the blue sky followed by a crowd of drones from neighboring hives and somewhere in the solitude of the blue the strongest male overtakes her and meets love and death in the same instant and the bride widow returns to the hive massacre of the males for the remainder of the summer the busy life of the hive goes on as before the queen perpetually egg-laying the workers foraging and nursing the drones leading a life of ease but one day the decree goes forth that those who do not work shall not eat indeed shall not live and the massacre of the males begins vigorously and pitilessly the long-suffering workers at last turn on the drones and slay them all flowers are becoming scarce and the days are short and chilly so the bees cease their labors and prepare for the long sleep of winter if sleep it could be called for the life of the hive is slackened but not completely arrested the bees gather together in a great cluster with their queen in their midst and by the beating of their wings they keep up a current of warm air the bees nearest the store cupboards pass honey to their neighbors and so food is circulated through the drowsy mass enough to keep the fire of life glowing ready to burst into flame again with the return of spring among different kinds of bees there are different degrees of sociability some such as the leaf-cutting bee are quite solitary others show a certain amount of cooperation combined with a large amount of independence end of section nineteen section twenty of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle the outline of science volume two by j arthur thompson chapter fourteen natural history part three the insect world section three the humble bee the humble bees bombus live in communities which last for one season only the queen humble bee after her autumn nuptial flight creeps into a hole under a sun-warmed bank and there lies torpid throughout the cold weather spring awakens her and she sets to work to prepare for her expected brood she secretes wax makes a few cells and lays her eggs in these she has herself to discharge the whole labor of foraging for honey and pollen keeping the cells clean kneading the bee bread and feeding and tending the hungry larva she is a queen in the sense of being the mother of the whole colony but she is a very hard-working queen for a time later when the first batch of young ones which are always workers are fully developed they take the domestic details on themselves and the queen can now devote herself to her true business of motherhood as in the case of wasps the community dissolves at the end of the summer workers and drones all dying but a few young queens surviving through the winter to found the colonies of the following year in this and in many other cases it is difficult to know whether one should speak of a large family or of an incipient society section five the story of wasps nests even solitary wasps instinctively provide for their young though they die before these hatch out they deposit the eggs in a shelter and leave with them a larder of fresh meat in the shape of living insects rendered unresisting by the paralyzing effect of the wasp sting on their nerve centers the social wasps live in communities which last from spring to autumn winter is a time of inactivity but in some secluded spot a cranny in a wall or a sheltered nook in a rubbish heap the queen wasp who made it at the end of the season is sleeping her winter sleep tiding over the hard months in a state of passiveness in much the same attitude that her body assumed during the pupa stage with the coming of spring she reawakens and the season's activities are soon in full swing the queen's first care is to choose a suitable site for the nest she is about to build and a cavity in the shelter of the gnarled roots of an overthrown tree is as good as any then she sets to work to collect wood fiber which she rasps with her jaws from posts and palings this wood pulp she kneads with her saliva into thin paper with which the nest is built 
she spreads the first layer on the root she has chosen as the foundation from which to hang the structure and gradually hour by hour pellet by pellet she moulds a disc and then a stalk and then a canopy to shelter the first layer of cells in each cell as it is completed she deposits an egg which she cements to the cell wall for the open end of the cell is directed downwards in a few days the legless grubs emerge and the queen becomes a nurse as well as a home builder until the older grubs mature and a staff of worker wasps is ready to take on the manual labor and allow the queen to devote herself to egg laying the workers add to the original comb and suspend a new story from it by little stalks one story is added after another the rounded outer covering is also extended by being hollowed out inside and added to outside this outer envelope may consist of as many as a dozen layers of the paper which is a waterproof and non-conducting material so that the necessary temperature for the development of the young is kept up the entrance opening of the envelope is always at the foot of the pendant nest and all the openings of the combs point towards it so that the young are reared in inverted cradles the young wasp grub at first keeps its position by clinging with its tail to the egg envelope while it pokes its head out for food but later uses its jaws and a sort of sucker foot on its tail as grasping organs if it does happen to fall out the worker nurses will probably throw it out of the nest just as they do with rubbish when they are cleaning the first thing the fully formed young wasp does if it has safely passed through its head downwards larval and pupa stages is to crawl about and visit the grubs tapping them on the head till they emit a tiny drop of fluid which the young wasp licks greedily then it is ready to help its mother with the housework and in a few days it is strong enough to go out on foraging expeditions the mother wasp also visits the grubs for this delectable drop how the wasp works and dies the young wasp's duties at first consist mainly of paper-making and building for the nest is continually growing she works backwards so that she does not tread on the newly applied pulp and she molds her material to the proper thickness testing it with her feelers but after a week or two her salviary glands are exhausted so that she has to give up the manufacture of paper and turn to the older wasp's task of caring for the young feeding them with the soft parts of insects and occasional sips of fruit juice or nectar and cleaning them with care so through the summer the busy life of the community goes on the queen has laid thousands of eggs and a great army of her daughters is engaged in enlarging the nest which may now have seven or eight tiers or combs enclosed in a great ball of gray paper in keeping it scrupulously clean and in caring for the rising generations some of these workers though they are never impregnated may occasionally lay eggs which like the unfertilized eggs of the queen invariably develop into males as the summer wanes the workers build larger cells in the lower combs these are the royal nurseries in which a brood of perfect females not sterile workers and males are reared on this brood the future of the race depends a few weeks and a great change takes place summer is still here and the wasp colony is at the height of its prosperity a healthy active community then the chill finger of autumn passes over it and the first shiver marks the beginning of the decline of the colony prosperity is succeeded by starvation and there are no stores to fall back on and the deadly numbness and demoralization break down the orderly routine of the nest the exhausted workers die in their thousands and with them the parent queen none but the young royalties survive and the males only long enough to mate with the young queens thereafter they also die the young queens destined to found new colonies next spring alone escape the common fate but the demoralization shows itself in them too for they devour the remaining eggs and larvae and on this rather cannibal fare they are able to survive the winter section six life histories story of cabbage white butterfly the food of insects is extremely varied not only in different species but also within a single life history and it naturally follows that there is much variety in the ways of obtaining it and in particular in the structure of the appendages associated with the mouth insects depend greatly on their sense of smell we are in search of suitable food the organs of smell minute olfactory pits or bristles are found chiefly on the antenna some insects move their feelers markedly on coming near strong smelling substances and some are unable to find their appropriate food without the aid of their antenna for instance carrion beetles which have had their antenna removed were found to be incapable of locating their evil-smelling food 
A very striking example of change of diet is seen in the life history of a butterfly, such as the common cabbage white butterfly. The small sculptured eggs are laid in large numbers on the plant which is to form the food of the caterpillars. The caterpillar emerges from the egg as a worm-like, short-legged little animal, green against the green of its natural haunt with simple eyes, short feelers, stumpy abdominal prolegs, in addition to the three pairs of jointed thoracic appendages, and strong hard jaws well suited for gnawing green food. Its business in life is to feed and to grow, and it feeds rapidly and almost continuously. It may eat many times its own weight in a day, but probably only digests the fluid part of the food. It outgrows its inexpansible chitinous covering and has to molt it an exhausting and dangerous process then it feeds and grows and molts again until at its limit of growth it passes into a resting phase it becomes a pupa or chrysalis the cabbage white butterfly larva suspends itself in a quiet corner by a silken thread with its tail against a support and the larval skin forms the pupa case but in many other pupa example many moths have the additional protection of a cocoon either of pure silk secreted at the jaws or of silk mixed with leaves, moss, or other extrinsic matter. The larva, example the caterpillar, now undergoes the great change, which is called metamorphosis. Within the cocoon, the body of the larva is broken down and is built up again on a new architectural plan. When the reconstruction is completed, the fully formed insect emerges. What a contrast! It is now an intensely active butterfly, having left behind it the shriveled skin of the creeping caterpillar and for a brief season it lives its aerial life growing not at all feeding but little and then only on liquid nectar by means of the long sucking tubes so different from the strong biting jaws of the caterpillar hunger is no longer the preoccupation the butterfly lives for love and before it dies it deposits its eggs on the green plant which it cannot itself eat but which forms the right food material for the offspring it does not survive to see Beetles. Beetles are essentially biters, with very strong and hard mouth parts, one part of which, the mandibles, are sometimes of relatively enormous size, with sharp saw-like edges. Many of them, such as the weevils, are vegetarians, feeding on green plants or on the bark and wood of trees, but many others are carnivorous and destroy numbers of wireworms, leather jackets, the larva of the daddy longlegs, sawfly larva, and other insects which are detrimental to crops. Others again feed on the decaying flesh of dead animals, and the busy burying beetles, which join forces in their work, act as useful bands of scavengers. An important linkage. Other groups of insects, with quite different mouth appendages, belong to the sucking types, which feed on liquid food. Instead of cutting toothed jaws, they have sucking tubes, often accompanied by sharp piercing needles, such as in the mosquito, which pierce the skin and suck in the blood of the victim. The nectar of flowers is another great source of liquid food, and it is sought by bees, butterflies, moths, and others which have sucking mouth organs. Perhaps the most important linkage in the whole system of animate nature is the linkage between flowers and their welcome insect visitors, for these visitors secure cross-fertilization, and this is often essential to seed-bearing. Section 7. Life Histories there are various ways in which the young forms of insects hatch out from the shells within which they develop. Some caterpillars eat through the shell, some maggots wriggle until it breaks, and some larvae have special instruments for the purpose. Thus the larval flea has a temporary piercing organ on its head. Many larvae differ markedly from the adult forms, and they are of several different types. They may be active, long-legged, flat-bodied, campodiform larva, very like the primitive bristle tails. Example, many beetle larvae, mayflies, stoneflies, etc. Or they may belong to the more worm-like eruciform groups such as the caterpillars. Example, young of moths and butterflies. Maggots and various grubs, these may be more sedentary in habit. In the course of the life history of many insects, a marked change of form takes place. Metamorphosis. According to the degree of metamorphosis, Insects are divided into three groups. 1. When no metamorphosis occurs and the young are hatched as miniatures of the adults, example, the most lowly insects, as the springtails and bristletails. 2. An intermediate group comprises those insects which show partial metamorphosis. 
In this type, the insect is able to move and feed practically throughout its development. The change is a gradual one. Through a series of molts, made necessary by the inexpansible armor of the chitin, the insect reaches adult condition. For instance, the young locust, as it emerges from the egg, has a pale, soft body swathed in transparent skin. It sheds its mantle, and gaining strength in the sunlight becomes firm and black, only differing from its parents in size, color markings, and the absence of wings. It feeds hungrily on vegetable substances and grows and molts, each molt leaving it larger, brighter, and hungrier than before, until after the third molt its wings begin to show. The molting process lasts only about half an hour, and the locust only stops feeding for a few hours. No phase of torpor or quiescence occurs in this half metamorphosis type and after the fifth skin casting the locust is a perfect winged insect soft and helpless and very vulnerable for a time but rapidly regaining firmness and vigor three when complete metamorphosis occurs a quiescent pupil or chrysalis stage comes between the larval and adult stages growth occurs during the larval stage a period of voracious feeding rapid growth and numerous molts the larva eats far more than is necessary to maintain its life, and lays up a reserve store which provides for the resting pupil stage which follows. The pupil stage is a time of little or no external activity, but great internal changes. The larval tissues are broken down, and their substance is restructured into the very different tissues of the adult. From the pupa case, the adult insect emerges, different in form and habit, winged and aerial. The metamorphosis implies far more than the acquisition of wings and one of the most marked differences between larva and adult is in most cases of difference in food and the method of taking it this is so great that the transition from larval to adult habits could not take place along with continuous external activity the quiescent period of reconstruction is essential section eight insects and man a great many insects live their busy days and perish without affecting man at all except that they delight him with their exquisite colors and markings and interest him with their ways but some are his friends and perhaps more he reckons his foes even the bee he too often shrinks from remembering the weapon she carries and forgetting her honey and the infinite service she renders by securing the pollination of many flowers the termite may be as much a tiller of the soil as the earthworm is but she attacks his furniture and the wood of his house the cocknail and lack that insects provide are relatively insignificant and locusts and honey may be thought of as a dainty dish in the east but a locust swarm will blight every green thing in a district he scatters the seed and when he looks for green heads to appear the earth opens and lo an army of long-faced yellow grasshoppers comes forth locusts wherever locusts are resident they do a great deal of damage but it is their sudden migratory swarms which are so disastrous they increase in numbers during favorable seasons then one year when the food supply is insufficient they collect in immense swarms and travel long distances devouring every green thing in their path a tobacco grower saw a swarm of locusts descend on a plantation of forty thousand young plants twenty seconds later not a leaf remained the old testament speaks of the locusts as one of the plagues of egypt they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left and there remained not a green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of egypt in addition to the formidable list of insects larvae and adults injurious to plants another list must be added of those which affect the health of man and of his stock there are a number of ways in which insects may affect the health of man they may have poisonous bites or stings as in the case of certain bugs bees wasps etc which cause inflammation and sometimes feverishness, or they may be parasitic. True parasites, such as fleas and lice, or accidental parasites, such as fly maggots, which sometimes reach the stomach and cause great pain. Again, they may carry disease germs. Most important of all are the cases in which an insect is an essential host in the development of a disease-producing organism, without which the life history of the organism cannot be completed for example the mosquito is not only the means of introducing into the blood of man the protozoan which causes malaria but the life history of the malaria organism cannot proceed without the insect the different stages can only be reached within the bodies of man and mosquito respectively so that the extermination of mosquitoes would wipe out malarial fever in other cases the insect is not necessary to the life of the disease producer 
but acts as a transmitter as in the case of plague where the bacillus is conveyed from rats to man by means of rat fleas which inoculate the victims while biting further cases of disease carrying form another list those of the simple carriers such as the common house fly it is not a blood-sucking insect but it has a body and legs thickly covered with hairs particularly well suited for transferring germs such as those of typhoid fever from place to place and it thus brings the microbes of the garbage heap to its next feeding place our dinner tables there is a long list of diseases in which insects play an important part typhus fever and lice sleeping sickness and tsetse flies relapsing fever and lice and many others many insects also affect the domestic animals for example the bot flies which cause severe boils and other disorders in cattle such examples out of the list serve to show some of the complex interrelations between man and insects and to indicate some of the aspects of the struggle for existence man's enemies are innumerable he tames the wild beasts and domestication brings its own penalty for a sucking insect wipes out a whole herd he exterminates great flesh-eating animals that would rival him but a common housefly brings microscopic germs to his table and spreads death through his cities it is hardly too much to say that the tendency of injurious insects to prolific multiplication is a continual menace to civilization and it should lead us to attach increasing importance to the preservation of the numerous insectivorous birds which maintain the balance of nature but this is a subject which will be discussed in a special article dealing with interrelations end of section twenty section twenty one of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. JXChristopher at Yahoo.com. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. The Science of the Mind, Part 1. The Science of the Mind. The New Psychology, Psychoanalysis It is something of a paradox that the most difficult thing the mind finds to master is the mind itself. In recent years, science has applied itself to the problem with a new keenness. Much attention has been given to the special study of the mind of the child, and valuable results have been obtained from the study of animal behavior. In particular, there have been many investigations at work on what has become known as a new psychology, which concerns itself largely with abnormal mental phenomena and subconscious operations, that part of mental activity which lies beyond the region of normal consciousness. Practically all the recent work in psychology has gone to show that there are elements in our minds of which we are unconscious, and that these elements often take a greater share in shaping our behavior than do the elements of which we are directly aware. The conception of the human mind has, in fact, undergone a profound change. It is revealed as a larger and more complicated affair than we had supposed, and we now see that what we had taken to be the mind is, in reality, a superficial, although very valuable part of a man's total mind. The Senses Sense experience forms the foundation of our mental life. In the course of long ages of evolution, our sense organs have evolved, and have given rise to that wonderful organ, the human brain. It is through the senses that all materials with which the mind builds up the higher forms of experience, memory, imagination, and thought, are obtained. For the senses are the gateways of knowledge. It would be going beyond the scope of our subject to describe fully the evolution of our various organs of sense, the mechanism of the eye, the ear, and so on. By these instruments, we are able to image and focus the world outside of us. A sensation depends on some physical influence the stimulus affecting some part of the outer or inner surfaces, or tissues of the body. In most cases, there is a special organ adapted to receive the stimulus, and so to transform its action into a nerve impulse for transmission to the brain, such as the eye, the ear, parts of the skin, and so on. The acquisition of the sense of sight vastly enlarged the horizon and widened the mental range, and so with hearing, which is the most recently acquired of our specialized senses. We know that the senses are not infallible, they are limited and imperfect. But there is no evidence whatever that the development of our senses has reached finality. The Brain 
The structure of the brain was briefly referred to in the section dealing with physiology. We need recall only that there are several main divisions of the brain, each with its own peculiar functions. The brain proper consists of the cerebrum, or larger brain, which occupies the whole of the upper and front parts of the cavity of the skull. It is divided into two great cerebral hemispheres, right and left, which are linked together by numerous nerve fibers. The outer surface, or cortex of the forebrain, is the seat of sensation and volition. It is a wrinkled or convoluted fold of grey cellular matter, which, if smoothed out, would cover a little over a foot and a half square. There are, in the convoluted part of our forebrain, the cerebral cortex, five or six times as many nerve cells as there are human beings in the world, and the complexity of interrelations is past all telling. The cerebellum, or lesser brain, lies at the back of the head, and below it is a medulla, whose functions have been previously explained. We need not, therefore, further enlarge on the outline of our nervous system. The cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, spinal cord, and nerves. That marvelous structure, the human brain, is the product of millions of years. Its history begins with life itself. The brain is a republic of nerve centers. Each part has its own peculiar function and all in interaction. There are parts of the brain whose function is unknown, parts which we believe serve for memory, judgment, and imagination. There is reason to suppose that one part is the seat of the processes associated with remembrance of articulation, that another is similarly associated with memory of the sound of words, yet another part of the brain is associated with visual images of words and letters. There is no lobe in the brain that is the seat of intelligence. It is the whole cortex, we might almost say the whole nervous system, or the whole body, that is concerned in intelligence, not any single region of it. It is by the plasticity, the power of adapting itself to new ways of learning, registering, and repeating new coordinations of actions, that the brain is marked out from the rest of the body, and even from the rest of the nervous system. Great ability, great intelligence even, are not dependent primarily on the brain. Mind in Evolution When we look back over the vaguely discerned evolution of animal behavior, we find that it had its starting point in the tentative movements of simple creatures, as has been explained in a previous chapter. We see such tentative movements in the very lowliest creatures. At an early stage there must have been established a number of particular answers, involuntary muscular and nervous movements to stimuli, which became enregistered in the creature, and these ingrained capacities increase in number. We discern a persisting state of the organism which varies the answer. There is probably a very simple expression of conation or endeavor. And in time, we come to perceive something of purposive behavior. With the establishment of a nervous system, there was opened up the possibility of a new kind of organism, that of reflex actions and tropisms, which play an important role in behavior, an organization which heredity perpetrates. Reflex actions are automatic movements of nerve cells and muscle cells of lower animals, which secure a fit and proper answer to a recurrent stimulus. Tropisms are on a somewhat higher plane. They are forced or obligatory movements of the animal as a whole. That is to say, every creature of the same kind, and in the same physiological state, will behave in the same way. On a still higher level, we have instinctive behavior which reaches its purest expression in ants, bees, and wasps. In birds and mammals, it is more likely to occur in cooperation with intelligence. Instinctive behavior agrees with reflex acts in not requiring to be learned, in being dependent on hereditary nervous predispositions, and in being exhibited approximately in the same way by all similar individuals of the species. We have discussed previously the history of these progressive evolutionary advances culminating in intelligent behavior and we saw wherein lay their survival value. We need not consider them further here. Reflex actions, tropisms, and instinctive behavior have become part of the inborn hereditary constitution of all higher animals. The question may be asked, what, besides what we call our mental faculties and our instincts, forms part of our natural inheritance? In other words, what compromises the innate constitution of the human mind? The question is not easy to answer. Dr. McDougall puts the question in the following form. Does the native basis of mind comprise any disposition, 
in addition to those which enter into the composition of the instincts? And if so, to what extent are they systematically linked together? We cannot answer this question with a negative. There is certainly much besides the faculties and the instincts comprised within the native basis of each human mind. If there were not, it would be impossible adequately to account for the vast superiority of mind of the human adult to that of the highest of the animal. Some of those who regard the mind purely from the physiological standpoint, and who believe that all we have called the structure of the mind can be adequately described in terms of the organized structure of the brain, take the view that the superiority of the native endowment of man consists chiefly or wholly in the presence of the brain of the infant, a great mass of unorganized nervous tissue which offers unlimited possibilities of progressive organization. But, even if we accepted the assumption that the structure of the mind can be wholly described in terms of nervous disposition and their connections, we could not accept the view that nothing of the mental organization beyond the instincts is innate. The bearing which all this has on our present problem is this. Can we say that the particular kind of activity known to us as thinking, feeling, and willing is implicit in the germ cell just beginning to develop into an organism of great complexity, an individuality in the one-cell phase of its being, a mind-body or body-mind telescope down? It varies, it makes experiments, it makes its own essays, an internal rearrangement, and self-expression. The germ cell is a sort of blind artist. Its sketches are submitted to the criticism of the fully formed organism, the seeing artist, who will put them in the proper light and bring out what there is in them of value. If the amoeba has in its small way a mind, an aspect of itself corresponding to our mind, and if the amoeba uses it when it goes hunting, two not unreasonable hypotheses, then it may be that the germ cell also has its analogue of mind, a not unreasonable hypothesis, since it develops into a creature with a mind. It is not the province of psychology to explain what mind is. That belongs to the region of philosophy. Still, the great problem which holds an interest for us is concerned with the relation that exists between body and mind. Is mind independent and distinct from the body, or is it merely an activity of the brain cells, a product of nerve stimulation? Mind and Matter Men have argued endlessly on the relation of mind and matter. To discuss even briefly the various theories, and there are many, would take a volume. What the precise connection between mind and body is, no one as yet has been able to say with any degree of certainty. On the mechanistic view, as it may be called, the mind is a direct product of the brain, and has no separate independent existence. Every act of intelligence, every mental activity, is due to a physiological mechanism. Every thought is a result of chemical or mechanical changes in the brain. An idea is but an explosion or discharge of the brain cell. An emotion is an activity of the brain bursting into flame. Every feeling of love, aspiration, or fear can be explained as due to purely physical changes which produce the vapor of thought, or the aroma of virtue. If it be held that during life all mental processes have their physiological concomitants, it is clear that these physiological concomitants, namely the molecular changes in the nerve center, would, if completely ascertained, afford an accurate index of the mental processes. But no one has ever shown what the chemical or mechanical changes are by which thought and feeling are produced. Mechanism, as applied to mind, remains a mere hypothesis. An hypothesis, it may be added, to which philosophy gives no support. Another view is that the mind is a separate existence. The relation of mind to body is, on this view, frequently held to be one of parallelism. The two series, mental and physical, are independent of each other. Each runs its own course, as two railway trains running side by side on a double track, or two rays of light projected towards the same infinitely distant point run parallel with one another in time and space. There is no cross-effect from one to the other, each is a closed system with its own laws. When consistently held, this view does not carry us much farther than the first view. Each point in the mental series must have its counterpart in the physical series. The laws that are established for the physical must also account for the psychical events. A third view is animism, the soul theory, the belief that there is an individual mind in each living animal body, that between the mind and its organism a vital relationship holds 
that the life processes are both mental and physical, that the directing force in evolution is to be found in the minds of the individual organism, the urge of feeling in the lower, the increasing strength of emotion and will, with the widening scope of interest and of thought in the higher organisms. Many arguments can be brought forward both for and against this theory, but we cannot discuss these here. There has also been much discussion of what is called the two-aspect theory, to which biological facts incline many inquirers. The theory assumes a psychophysical being, a reality which we know under two aspects. We think of the organism as one, as, while it lives, an indissoluble psychophysical being. The living creature gives an account of itself in two ways. It can know itself as something extended and intricately built up, burning away, moving, throbbing. It can also know itself as a seed of sensations, perceptions, feelings, wishes, thoughts. But there is not one process, thinking, and another process, cerebral metabolism, vital processes and nerve cells. There is a psychophysical life, a reality which we know under two aspects. Cerebral control and mental activity are, on this view, different aspects of one natural occurrence. What we have to do with is the unified life of a psychophysical being, a body-mind or mind-body. The advantages of the two-aspect theory, if it is tenable, are that it does justice to the extraordinary intimate independence of what we may call mental processes and brain processes. It regards them as two equally real aspects of the continuous life of the organisms. The objective side is the body as a living whole. The subjective side, in man's case, is the unity of the mind. In these days, the now old-fashioned materialism of the previous generation, as Mr. Bertrand Russell says, receives no support from modern physical science if, as seems to be the case, physics does not assume the existence of matter. We saw in a previous chapter, The Foundation of the Universe, what the new view of the constitution of matter is. The atom of every element of matter is revealed as a particle of electricity. What electricity itself is, we do not know. But we see how it comes about that the physicist tends to think of matter as less and less material. So does the chemist, and so the biologist. In that sense, the old-fashioned materialism has gone. The view of Mr. William James and others is that the stuff of the world is neither mental nor material, but, for lack of a better name, a neutral stuff, out of which both are constructed. Mr. Bertrand Russell, in his work The Analysis of Mind, endeavors to develop this view as regards mental phenomena. We cannot sum up the problem better than another writer who says, Supposing we were able to understand all the phenomena, chemical, physical, physiological, of this intricate mechanism, we would be no nearer a solution of the problem of the connection between the objective and the subjective impacts of the phenomena. A philosophy which recognizes both sets of phenomena, mental and physical, mutually adjusted and ever interacting, recognizes the facts of the case, and does not delude the mind by offering a solution which is in reality no solution at all. The difficulty is somewhat lessened if we assume that behind all physical and mental phenomena there is a metaphysical essence, conscious or unconscious, and that the phenomena we term physical and mental are only different sides of the same kind. Such an essence can never be known to science, and the discussion of the possibility of its existence and of its properties belongs to the province of philosophy. Mental Processes Psychology is the science of the mind, or more strictly, let us say it is a science of the behavior of living things. It includes the study of consciousness. In the sense that the brain receives all those nervous impulses that result in consciousness, it would be true to say that the brain is a seat of consciousness. But that does not provide a solution of the problem of the origin of consciousness. No one doubts that consciousness has a material substratum. But the problem of the relation between the mental state and the molecular movements on nervous matter is as far from solution as in the days when little was known of the physiology of the nervous system. The old-fashioned method was to assign to the mind certain so-called faculties, perception, conception, imagination, reason, will, to explain the operations which they denote. The mind has not its will here, its consciousness there, and its reason somewhere else. It reasons, wills, and is conscientious as a whole. Thought, feeling, and will do not lie side by side, as it were, 
like stones in a mosaic, any of which could be removed without destroying the rest. They rather resemble the functions of the body, none of which are possible without the cooperation of all the others. Another way to describe mental activity was to regard every idea as capable of existing in two conditions, or forms. On the one hand, it might be a conscious idea, or exist in consciousness, consciousness being spoken of as an illuminated chamber into which ideas enter in turn, to be lit up and active for a short period. And on the other hand, it might exist as an unconscious idea in the memory, a sort of Hades or dim underworld to which each idea, or its ghost, returns after its brief exposure to the light of consciousness, there to await and to seize any opportunity of emerging again into light and life. Within this underworld, ideas remain linked together in complex groupings. The whole assembly of ideas, thus linked in the obscurity of memory, constitutes the structure of the mind, and mental activity consists in each idea dragging up after it into the light whatever ideas are linked or associated with it. When we come to the mind proper, we may, using a purely pictorial analogy, regard it as consisting of three layers. The top layer we may call the region of the conscious life. It is, as it were, a vividly illuminated region, where everything that goes on is clearly seen. It is to this region that we normally refer when we seek the explanation of our conduct, and, as we shall see, the explanations we obtain in that way are often wrong. A little below this clear region is a semi-conscious region, a region which can become accessible to us by effort. It is in this region, for instance, that the information which is not present to our minds, but which we can remember, may be considered to be stored. Sometimes the contents of this region can be exhumed only by considerable effort. Sometimes a very slight stimulus is sufficient. Beneath this layer again lies the region of the unconscious, and this region is, normally, quite inaccessible to our conscious mind. The description we have given is, of course, figurative, since we cannot suppose that the mind occupies space. But this division into layers is helpful in enabling us to understand the modern theories of the mind. The unconscious is the seat of the mental elements associated with the great primary instincts, and it is a great source of psychic energy. Of the activities going on in it, we have no direct knowledge. We can infer something, however, as we shall see later, from observation, and more especially, according to some authorities, from dreams. The unconscious is the very basis of the psychic life of the individual. The Importance of Complexes Mental phenomena never occur singly, but always in some complex combination or another. It will help us in understanding the nature of the mind to consider it as a network of mental elements. Every mental element, every idea as we say, which comes into the conscious mind calls up others. There are associations of ideas, to use the language of the older psychologist. It is because ideas are associated that we are able to go about our daily lives. If no idea suggested any others, or if others were suggested purely at haphazard, we should never be able even to cross the road. A number of mental elements associated together so as to form some more or less loosely knit system is called a complex. To some men, for instance, the sight or sound of a typewriter may always, or usually, suggest to them an office. The smell of a certain flower may always bring back some early experience, and so on. Associations of this kind, associations of ideas, as it were, are called complexes. We may think, if we like, of ideas forming groups, and the whole of the contents of the mind as made up of groups of ideas, complexes. Further, complexes vary enormously in the emotional energy associated with them. Besides the great number of minor complexes brought about by a man's education, the nature of his work, and so on, there are so-called universal complexes. These are the complexes which center around the three great primary instincts, or groups of instincts, and they are known as the sex complex, the ego complex, and the herd complex. Complexes which directly center around the great primary instincts such as sex are associated with a great fund of emotional energy. The actual mental elements present in the sex complex of any particular man, besides depending on inherited characteristics, depend also on his personal history. The ego complex, 
associated with the primary instincts of nutrition and self-preservation, has most of its elements beneath the conscious level. And the same may be said of the herd complex, which depends upon the gregarious instinct in man, and which plays an enormously important part in his life, as we shall see. Amongst the three great universal complexes, the ego complex is the oldest and most profound. This is the complex with which is associated man's recognition of his self. This very powerful complex may give rise to all sorts of unpleasant manifestations, to various exhibitions of greed and of the desire of self-aggrandizement. But it also gives rise to some of the most beneficent of man's activities. Amongst these, we may mention the desire for construction, for the making of something which is a personal achievement, whether it be a house, a poem, or a system of philosophy. The desire to construct has certainly been one of the most potent factors in human advancement. The Herd Complex The second great universal complex is the herd complex, and this, as we have already said, depends upon the fact that man is gregarious. We do not know at what point in man's development he first developed the gregarious instinct. It must have been quite early, however, that man began to live in association with his fellows. The advantages bestowed by gregariousness are obvious. But the instinct of gregariousness brings with it certain consequences which are of the utmost importance in the psychic life. This instinct brings with it great suggestibility. The individual, as a member of the herd, must be very suggestible to impulses coming from the herd in order to act in harmony with it. He must be able to yield unquestioning obedience to the voice of the herd. In the case of man, his rational faculty, combined with this suggestibility as a gregarious animal, leads to the most diversified manifestations. The great bulk of man's opinions are in reality strictly non-rational, and are products purely of herd suggestion. But that does not prevent him rationalizing them. Many of them he does not trouble to rationalize. They appear to him obvious as obvious as that good food is desirable. They come with instinctive force. The moral code in force in a community furnishes a set of beliefs of this kind. This set of beliefs changes from time to time and from country to country, but whatever set of beliefs may be in vogue in any particular community at any particular time is obviously right. Two Main Types we cannot consider in detail the manifestations of the three great groups of primary instincts, but we may discuss for a moment two types, and one or other of which nearly every human being can be classed. These two types of human beings are called by Mr. Trotter the stable and unstable types. The stable type is the type which is often described as forming the backbone of the country. A man of this kind is energetic, strong-willed, and full of settled convictions. He is perfectly at home with the laws and traditions of the community of which he is a member. His aims are of the kind that the community as a whole can understand and approve, and he is steadfast in his pursuit of them. He has decided views on moral questions, and on political and any other subjects. He is never in doubt as to what is right and what is wrong. The great drawback to this type is its insensitiveness to experience it is incapable of surveying any question from an entirely fresh standpoint. Indeed, it is apt to regard the searching questioning of accepted and established things, such as a code of moralities or a system of politics, as either foolish or wicked or both. Great changes in current practice and ideas, however desirable such changes may be, cannot be affected by the class of people, and that predominates in numbers, which has the strong prevailing gregarious instinct, in other words, in which the herd complex is strongly ingrained. The unstable type has qualities almost exactly opposite to those of the stable type. Thus, a man of this type has very few settled convictions, although he may have plenty of enthusiasms. He can easily be won to a new cause, and he as easily falls away therefrom. He may undertake a number of projects, but it is unlikely that he will persist with any one of them long enough to carry it into a successful conclusion. He has what is called a weak will, and he can by no means accept the ruling of the community on all questions. His great positive merit is his sensitiveness to experience, and indeed, it is from this that all his trouble springs. 
he is always changing his mind, because he is always open to fresh impressions. He is, usually, the intellectual superior of the stable type, although the stable type often despises him. But each type has its great disadvantage, and neither represents what a human being could and should be. Conflicts The fact that different complexes may be incompatible with one another leads us to the important question of conflict. A perfectly healthy mind is a mind which has established complete harmony between its different complexes. But the perfectly healthy mind, in this sense, is very rare. We usually find that several of a man's complexes are incompatible with one another, and on those occasions when more than one are aroused, there is a conflict between them. Thus it may often happen that a man's selfish desires, those springing perhaps from his ego complex or his sex complex, conflict with the moral code of the community, a code which has great weight with him, because it is associated with his herd complex. Such conflicts are favorite themes for novelists. The father, torn between patriotism and his love for his son. The intending monk, torn between his religion and his love of his family. The man torn between an illicit love passion and a sense of morality. Conflict plays a prominent part in the psychic life of most people, and it leads to very important consequences. For the conflict must be settled, and there are two very important ways of settling it. There is the method of rationalization. One of the conflicting complexes is allowed to triumph, but not consciously. Reasons are invented for the resultant action which have nothing to do with its psychic cause, but which prevent the man from feeling ashamed, as we say. Thus, a primitive, brutal desire for revenge may be disguised as justice. An exhibition of ruthless greed, as in some unscrupulous business deal, for instance, will be explained by pointing out that it is for the good of the community that its most efficient citizens should come to the top, and so with other conflicts. Another very important method of settling a painful conflict is by repression of one of its factors. It is this method which has been chiefly studied by Freud, and he has succeeded in showing how very great importance it is. A man decides completely to ignore one of his conflicting complexes. He puts it out of his mind, but, as Freud has shown, the ignored complex is not thereby destroyed. It is repressed into the unconscious, but it is still energetic and may manifest its existence in a number of ways, ranging from certain phenomena of forgetfulness down to hysteria and insanity. It may happen, for instance, that the repressed complex leads to a certain kind of forgetfulness, a forgetfulness of those things with which it is associated. A man may forget an appointment from which he anticipated something unpleasant, he may forget the existence of unpaid bills. Such cases are cases of active forgetting, and are to be distinguished from cases of passive forgetting, where the matter is forgotten simply because it made very little impression on the mind. A slip in speaking or writing may sometimes testify to a repressed complex, the substituted word corresponding to a wish, but a repressed wish of the speaker or writer, as when the president of the Austrian lower house announced that the sitting was closed when he should have said it was opened, the reason being that he privately expected no good from the sitting and would have liked it closed. End of section 21. Recording by James Christopher, JX Christopher at yahoo.com. Section 22. Of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. The Science of the Mind, Part 2. Psychoanalysis. Professor Freud's Theories. A comparatively new branch of psychology is that closely associated with the work of Professor Freud of Vienna. It deals mainly with the phenomena of the unconscious. Whatever may be said of Freudian theories, they have at least opened up a wide field of study. Part of Freud's doctrine has become fairly well established. On the other hand, a great deal of it is regarded as merely ingenious theory, which is not generally accepted. This new psychology is of very great interest 
because of the bearing it has on medical practice and the work of the teacher. The chief theory of the Freudian psychology is that there is a great part of the mind of which we are unconscious, that this unconscious part exercises an enormous influence upon our thoughts and actions without ourselves being aware of it. Freud conceived the idea that the influence of the unconscious mind was especially active as a cause of dreams, and thus he was led to his now familiar theory of the interpretation of dreams. The work of Professor Freud, his disciples and his critics, has thrown a flood of light upon the working of the human mind, and led to curious alterations of our own views upon dreams, insanity, myths, art, and religion. In dealing with patients who were suffering mainly from functional diseases of the nervous system, Freud found that what had been regarded as the symptoms of the disease, such as paralysis of the limbs, blindness, deafness, and mutism, were frequently connected in some definite way with the original onset of the disease. Blindness, for example, might date from some violently painful occurrence of which the patient had been a witness. This connection was not, as a rule, recognized by the patient's waking consciousness but it revealed itself occasionally to the doctor when the patient was hypnotized. Sometimes also, it was brought out by the dreams which the patient described. But in general, the ordinary consciousness of the subject resisted all attempts to probe back to the original cause of the disease. Turning his attention to dreams, Freud found that in the case of normal individuals also, there were painful experiences, never revived in the fully conscious mind, but playing a great part in the dreams of the subject appearing there in a more or less disguised form, and that the interpretation of the dream in both normal and abnormal subjects invariably led back to some wish or desire of the individual, which it was impossible for him, for physical, moral, or social reasons, to realize in waking life. The dream was the mimic realization of the wish. The instinctive or voluntary forgetting, Freud called repression. The repressed ideas were not, however, destroyed but were constantly endeavoring to force their way back into consciousness. He gave the name of the unconscious to the mass of repressed memories of all kinds. For the repression of a wish involves also the repression of the whole system of experience to which the wish belongs. Hence, for example, the fact that we can rarely remember our infancy time at all. The Subconscious We have all some experience of what is called the subconsciousness. An idea, as it passes to and from the focus of consciousness, gradually becomes clear and vivid, then fades away into dimness and vagueness, till it is merged in the general mass of feeling and loses all distinctiveness. A word is on the tip of the tongue. Later, it is clearly thought and spoken. I have an appointment to remember. I do not think of it for hours, and then, in good time perhaps, it walks into my consciousness. I resolve to awake at six in the morning, and, if my mind is of the right kind, as the clock strikes six, or just before it, I awake. These are different cases in which an idea, a thought, is apparently not in consciousness, and yet not wholly out of it. The term subconsciousness has been used for this class of phenomena, where, apart from the dominant, or personal consciousness, certain strands of experience, which have once been conscious, continue somehow to live and in due time make their influence felt in the dominant consciousness. The theory of Freud is that in the unconscious part of the mind there lie dormant memories of the past, and especially repressed impulses. These repressions represent the resistance we make to a wish or impulse which we think we ought not to satisfy, because it conflicts with some other interest, or they mean the effort we make to put out of our mind some unpleasant memory. The effort to repress may not be deliberate, it may be unconscious repression. In any case, there may be a repression to such an extent that the memories pass entirely from us, or, as it is held, they are pushed deep into the unconscious, where they continue to exist. We are asked to believe that the unconscious includes many impulses and memories which remain buried in the depths of the mind, and that they persist in trying to return to the living mind. Further, it is said that to some extent they do so, influencing the mental life, even although we are not conscious of the influence at work. In this way, repressed tendencies are supposed to get a partial satisfaction. Cases of Mental Disorders The records of medical men and their work connected with nerve cases in military hospitals during the war 
has provided much material for the study of abnormal psychology of this kind. Cures for paralysis of various organs, of morbid obsessions, and unreasonable fears have been recorded and described by responsible members of the medical profession. The origin of many mental troubles has been traced to repression of disturbing emotional experiences, bygone and forgotten by the patient. The recalling or revival of such lost memories of patients by medical men skilled in psychopathology have, by clearing the mind of the patient, enabled physicians to effect many striking cures of mental disorder. The theory is that the bringing to light and the reliving of the suppressed emotional experience is a means of getting rid of excessive emotion. The patient is enabled to assume a new attitude towards them. By way of illustration, we may give one instance. The following case of the influence of forgotten experience is described by Dr. W. H. Rivers in The Lancet, and we take this excellent summary of it as given by Professor Valentine in his Dreams in the Unconscious. It is a case of a young medical officer who, even before the war, had a horror of closed-in spaces, such as tunnels and narrow cells. He would never travel by the tube railway and was seized with fear in a train which passed through a tunnel. One can imagine his intense distress when on entering a dugout he was given a spade and was told it was for use in case he was buried alive. His sleep was greatly disturbed, and his health became so bad that he was invalided home. Instructions to keep his thoughts from the war and to dwell exclusively on pleasant topics proved useless. He had terrifying dreams of warfare, from which he would awake, sweating profusely and thinking he was dying. At this stage he came under the care of Dr. Rivers. The patient was asked to try and remember any dreams he might have and to record any memories which come to his mind while thinking over the dreams. Shortly afterwards he had a dream, and as he lay in bed thinking it over, there came into his mind an incident which seemed to have happened when he was about three years of age, and which had so greatly affected him at the time that it now seemed to the patient almost impossible that it ever could have been forgotten. He recalled that, as a little boy, he and his friends used to visit an old man in a house near his own, and to take him odd articles discarded at home, in return for which they received a copper or two. On one occasion he went alone, down the long, dark passage leading to the old man's home, and on turning back found that the door at the opening of the passage had banged to, and he was unable to escape. Just then a dog in the passage began to bark savagely, and the little child was terrified, and continued so until he was released. After another dream, the patient woke up to find himself repeating, McCann, McCann. It occurred to him suddenly that this was the name of the old man. Inquiry of the parents of the patient revealed the fact that an old rag and bone man had lived in such a house as the patient remembered, and that his name was McCann. The result of this recovery of memory, with the explanation of his abnormal fears of closed-in spaces, had a great effect on the patient. A few days afterwards he lost his fear of closed-in spaces, and he afterwards travelled in tube railways and tunnels without discomfort. Indeed, he was so confident of himself at once that he wished Dr. Rivers to lock him up in some subterranean chamber of the hospital as a proof of his cure. The particular point to be noticed here is that an entirely forgotten experience continued, apparently, to have an influence upon conscious mental life. Other points of interest are these that the original experience was an intensely emotional and disturbing one, that the experience was recalled through reflecting on a dream, that the conscious effort of will to banish the unreasoning fears had no effect, that the fearsome experience, though repressed until forgotten, found its way out to consciousness through the repeated emotions of fear. This constant fear was stimulated by being enclosed in spaces, that is, by situations similar to the original one, though that was forgotten. There are many such cases as this on record. A great deal of work has been done on similar lines, and the study of disorders of various kinds having a mental origin has been put on a scientific basis within the last few years. This is not the place to describe the methods of the practitioner. The principles followed depend on individual cases. Dreams Much, probably far too much, has been made of the claim that psychoanalysis may be applied to the interpretation of dreams. The starting point from which Freud's theory was developed was the interpretation of dreams, based on the assumption that dreams are the symbolical expression of repressed tendencies. 
To claim that every dream is determined by the subconscious working of a repressed tendency is unwarrantable, and the theory is not accepted by those most qualified to speak on the subject. On the other hand, it would be an extreme view, as Dr. William Brown says, to deny meaning to all dreams, and regard them as merely the confused and jumbled reappearances during sleep of memories belonging to the person's past history, strung together in any chance order. The recent work on dream analysis, however, has added immensely to our knowledge, and we now possess a theory which undoubtedly covers a very large part of dream phenomena, even though it certainly does not cover the whole. This theory is, briefly, that a dream is a symbolic fulfillment of a repressed wish. The wish has been repressed because, for one reason or another, its appearance in the conscious mind is attended with pain. But, as we have seen, repressed elements do not lose their vitality. They continue to work and they endeavor, as it were, to manifest themselves in some way or another. Now, during sleep, the barriers between the conscious and the unconscious are to some extent relaxed. Elements which are ruthlessly repressed in the waking life are now subjected to a less severe repression. But these elements cannot emerge in their naked purity, as it were. They exhibit themselves in a disguised form, often of the most fantastic description. In this way, the wish secures a partial satisfaction. In his book on the interpretation of dreams, Freud gives a large number of such cases of symbolic fulfillment and explains the technical process by which these dreams are related to forgotten episodes in the life of the patient. Many of these cases are more ingenious than convincing. Not all dreams are due to repressed wishes. Many dreams are more or less inchoate reproductions of impressions received during the day. Such dreams, however, have a fragmentary character. In very many cases where the dream is a rounded and completed whole, it is also an allegory a symbolic manifestation of elements which have been repressed into the unconscious. The repressed elements, even so, do not secure complete fulfillment. Repression is still operative, although it is relaxed. There is still what Freud calls the censor. Dreams may illustrate very interestingly, in fact, the indirect ways in which psychic energy seeks an outlet, when direct satisfaction is for some reason or another denied it. Many works of art are similar to dreams in this respect. In some cases of very deep and powerful repressed complexes, a dream fulfillment may not be satisfactory. An actual pathological condition may be set up. Hysteria, insanity, and associations of personality, as in certain well-known cases of double personality, may be caused by the repressed complex. Many cases of this kind were brought into being by the terrible psychic strains of the war. It is admitted that a certain class of dreams may be possible of interpretation, but we cannot discuss the subject further here. It cannot be accepted that Freud's theory of repression accounts satisfactorily for all dreams. Another view is that which regards dreams in quite a different light. Dr. William Brown puts it in these words. The function of a dream is to guard sleep. Sleep is an instinct, like fear, flight, and the rest, and has a function which has developed in the course of evolution. At night this instinct of sleep comes into play, but it finds itself in conflict with other instincts and tendencies, as well as with external impulses. Desires, cravings, anxieties, the memories of earlier days, all of which are the lower and fundamental elements of the mind, well up and strive towards consciousness, while the main personality is in abeyance. If they reach consciousness, sleep is at an end. But the dream, which is a sort of intermediary form of consciousness, intervenes and makes the impulses innocuous, so that sleep persists. This theory covers the entire ground of all types of dreams. There are other aspects of abnormal psychology which imply subconscious operation with which we have not dealt. The subject of telepathy, clairvoyance, materializations, and other phenomena which appertain to psychic experience will be discussed by Sir Oliver Lodge in the following chapter. End of Section 22 and End of The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson
Recording by James Christopher. JX Christopher at yahoo.com. For LibriVox at LibriVox.org.